Everybody doing good? Everybody get a good break? Went and paid and all that good stuff? Good deal, good deal. So tonight, we are concluding the GOAT series, how Jesus was the greatest sacrifice of all time. Uh, And tonight is going to be really, really cool uh, in a weird sort of way. And you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, I do need your attention though, all right? So focus here, all right? So, um, usually, again, I mean, it seems like I've said this a lot here lately, but usually the way I would start out is tell you some goofy story where I am the brunt of the joke, you know? That's not what I'm going to do tonight, unfortunately. It's going to start out a little bit somber. Uh, I want to talk about tonight a subject that is difficult to talk about. And what I mean is it's one of those topics that as soon as someone starts talking about it, it can make you feel weird or maybe even like depressed or negative in some sort of way. My hope for tonight is that maybe even even if you start out that way in tonight's message, you'll you'll find that it ends up really positive. So that's kind of where we're going psychologically, if you will. Like you might start out a little bit depressed, I don't know, but hopefully you'll get to a point where you're like, Heck yeah, Jesus, right? That's my hope for you tonight. But here's what I want to tell you about. I, I think I've told this story before, but I know that a lot of you might not have heard this. But I want to tell you about uh, when my grandfather died, okay? I told you, immediately somber. Um, my grandfather was, like, the toughest dude that I ever knew. Like, and when I say toughest, it's not because he was like, ooh, and walked around like that. That's not what I mean by tough. I'm talking like this dude... Nailed his fingers together on accident with a nail going, and like he couldn't. I mean, that, and he's like, shoot, right? Like, whereas most of us be like, ah, you know, he's just like, oh. He actually goes up to my dad. They're building his house. He, he's like, oh man. And he walks up to my dad, and he's like, my dad's name is James. He's like, James, I'm bleeding all over your floor. I'm sorry. <laughs> my dad's like. Oh my gosh, get in the truck. We're going to the, you know, the emergency room. Right? And he's like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. And they go to the emergency room and pull the nail out of his finger, stuff like that. I, I, one time, too, he was walking in front of my grandmother's house with a, with a horse. Right? Like he is like, walking this horse. As to why he wasn't riding it, I don't know. But he's walking this horse, and he gets behind this horse for some reason, and the third thing goes, and kicks him right in the, right in the forehead. Boom! Right? And he goes flying back, like 15 foot. I don't know. That's probably an exaggeration, but it was bad. And he goes, come on, dude. I mean, I'm serious. Toughest man I ever knew. But let me tell you his one weakness. I'm sure he had many. But one of his biggest weaknesses is I would go to his house time and time and time again and share the gospel with this man. Because he didn't know Jesus. Like him and my grandmother, they got divorced and like wrecked him. He went and like lived in her backyard. I know it's weird. He built a little shack in her backyard. It's really strange. And he lived there till the day he died. But every time I go talk to him, I share the gospel with him about how Jesus can be his savior. That he died on the cross for his sins. That he can be guilt free. He can be shame free if he just embraces and gives his life to Christ. And he would always say something like, Nah, you can't do that for me. You don't know what I've done. I'll never tell you all the things that I've done, specifically to your grandmother. And I knew some of the things that he had done to my grandmother because he wasn't a good husband. He beat her. He did some horrible, horrible things. But I could never, like, I would just share the gospel with him over. And over. I ain't kidding. I bet I did hundreds of times. And he would, he would always, like, try to change the subject. Let's go fishing. When we're going fishing, like I, I ain't talking about fishing. Let's talk, you know. And he would never listen. And he was also like so tough. He was like a cat. He had like nine lives in the hospital all the time. And every single time he'd go in the hospital, we would all be like, mm, I think this might be it. Like this might be the time. Like dude had like six blood clots in his lungs one time because he started smoking when he was like four. And we're like, I don't know how you get out of that. Like. I think grandpa's going to be done because he's got six blood clots in his lungs. And he'd just like, and will himself out of it and come out. It's incredible. And every time, 
I'd go to the hospital and share the gospel with him. Until this last time, he goes into the hospital, and I don't even remember what it was for. But I'm just tired. I was sick, and I'm not proud of what I'm about to say. It's not right. I'm just being real with you. I was just tired. Like every single time I would go to share the gospel with my grandpa, and he wouldn't listen to it and didn't care about it, it would like kill me a little bit more inside. So I was just like, you know what? I'm not doing that no more. I'm done with that. Like I've shared with him. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'm not doing it no more. Like I had made this decision in my mind, unfortunately. And I remember going to his room, and he's sitting there, and he's not doing well. Like not doing well. Like this is pretty obviously going to be the last time. And I'm sitting there, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm still questioning. Do I, do I share with him or do I not share with him? And I don't. And I'm about to walk out. And the friend that I had with me leans over to my grandpa. And it's like the most irritating thing on the planet because I spent all these, all these many times, hundreds of times, sharing the gospel, gospel with him elaborately. And all my friend does is goes, hey, you want to receive Christ? And he's like, yes, I do. I'm like, what the heck? I did this hundreds of times, but... But it's just incredible. Like, he finally does. He gives us like, and literally, like, he only lives like two more days. But in those two days, it's like my grandfather experiences this incredible joy and transformation just in two days of the rest of his life. Unbelievable. And I remember the day he died, standing there at his bed. He's dead, in the bed. And I remember standing there and I'm thinking, and, and maybe I'm weird for this, but I remember thinking, like, I'm supposed to be sad right now. Like, I love my grandfather. It's not that I didn't love him, but I wasn't sad. And I think the reason why I wasn't sad is because I knew where he was now. Like, it didn't matter anymore. Like, certainly I, I would miss my grandfather. There would be all these questions, like, maybe I should have went fishing with him. Like, I, I didn't go as much as I, all these things. But in that moment, I'm standing there at my grandfather who has passed away, and I'm like, I'm just not even sad. Which is not normal. But it's because I understood where he stood with Jesus, and specifically with death. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. This weird, odd, somber topic that is death. It's one of these things that your generation, like your age group, it's not your generation, it's just your age group, struggles with. Because you either, you either... Don't think about it at all because you think that you have the whole life, or your whole life ahead of you, that you'll die at some ripe old age of 89 or something like that, or it consumes you. Like maybe, maybe someone close to you has passed on, and it consumes you. You're scared to death, literally. Or maybe a friend has went way early, way, and it didn't make no sense. And you get in this weird place of either you don't think about death at all like you should or you think about death way too much to the point to where you're more scared of death than you ought to be. And that, that's what I want us to talk about tonight. This is this incredible story that we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, where Jesus does something so incredible that it completely changes everything. Like it's a precursor of what he would do himself on the cross and in the resurrection. But it's this unbelievable story. Look, look what it says. It says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and, and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was, carried, was being carried out. Okay, let's just start there for a second. Nothing's out of the ordinary yet. People die all the time, unfortunately. Right? But people die. So there's nothing strange about this story yet. Man who died was being carried out. Then we get to the odd part. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So immediately, only son of a mother, and she is a widow. So what does that mean? It tells us a couple of things. First of all, he died young. And I think this is where it touches us immediately, this story. Because... You've experienced it at some point, I'm sure. I know I have. Where someone dies who is not supposed to die. Someone goes quicker and earlier than you would ever imagine that they were ever supposed to go. Like again, we have in, the, in our minds this thought process that 
We're, gonna li- we're all going to live to this ripe old age of 80 or 90 or 100 or whatever your aspiration of longevity is, whatever it is. And then something happens. Someone, maybe, again, maybe a friend, maybe a loved one, and they go too soon. It just does not make sense. And let me tell you something. If, that's ever, if you've ever experienced that, as I know many of you have, man, it destroys you. It wrecks your world because suddenly it grounds you to this idea of death. It shows you this reality that we are not promised tomorrow. That there's not just some like law for all of humanity that you have to live to 80 and then you die. Like that's not reality. That we don't know when we will die. We just don't. And so this is what this mother unfortunately is experiencing. Her son, the only person that she has, her husband's already died. She's a widow. Her son dies. And I need you to understand where where she's at right now. In this world, in this culture that we're reading about right now. Like there is no government programs. This isn't the cool United States of America. This is ancient Israel. Do you know who takes care of this woman? Her son. Or her husband, but he's dead. So now her son. He is the one who's going to take care of her. He dies, and so you know what that means for this woman? Almost certain death. Best case scenario for her is for her to live in this horrible life of poverty. So her son son dies, but there's also this realization and this almost sentence of poverty and misery for the rest of your life. She finds herself in this horrible, jacked up situation. That ought not be. She didn't plan for And it's hit her like a ton of bricks. And she finds herself this day waiting for her son's funeral, not knowing what tomorrow brings. I think this again right here is where this story touches us too. Because if you've ever experienced tragedy, maybe it's not death, but maybe it's a horrible circumstance in your life. You find yourself here. You find yourself in this reality of where like, I don't even know what the next step is. I don't know what tomorrow is. Looks like, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what the route is. I don't have a plan B. Like, I'm just not sure what, what's next. And so what you start doing, which I imagine she was doing, the Bible doesn't say this, but I imagine she starts asking why. God, we've served you. My husband gave his life. He gave to you. We gave to you. We prayed every night. We read your holy word. And you took my husband, and then you took my son, and now I'm living in this horrible life that I'm now living in. It's like, in Bible study, at 4 o'clock, we were talking about this. It doesn't matter how good of a Christian you are. It doesn't matter how mature you are spiritually. If something hits you hard enough, and you get into a bad enough situation, you'll hit your knees, and you'll probably start asking why. You'll start giving God this resume of all of the things that's awesome about you, all the things that you've done for him. I've been there. And you want to know why. Why would you do this to me, God? And this idea of death will consume you. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Look at Jesus' response. And when the Lord saw her, this is Jesus, He had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Think about how, think about this for a second. How absolutely radical of a statement this is for Jesus to make to this woman. You go to a funeral. Someone's loved one, the person that, the only person they had left. The one that they loved more than anybody on this planet has died. And you walk up to them and you say, don't cry. How rude is that? How seemingly ridiculous is that? How inconsiderate that would seem to be. Jesus walks up to this woman, has compassion for her situation, says, do not weep. And here's what we need to understand first and foremost, right? Like when you're on your knees, when you're in that difficult situation... Like you don't know what your next step is. You don't know, there's no plan B. Like you don't know what else to do. You don't know what tomorrow holds, any of that. And you're struggling. You start asking God why is he doing all these things to do. Here's what you need to understand about Jesus. 
He has compassion for you. It's not as if God is so, he is massive, he is huge, he is big. Don't misunderstand that. He holds the world in the palm of his hand. But the, the size and power of God does not take away from the reality that he also cares and loves you more than you could ever imagine. And what that means for you and me is that when you hurt, it troubles him. He's like a father. He is a father to you. And when, you, when you're in a ball on your knees and you don't know what to do and you're sobbing and you're crying and you're suffering, he's there. And he has compassion. And whether you can feel him or not, he's wiping your tears. And he's saying, I know, I understand. I get your suffering. I get your pain. I get your turmoil. I get what you're going through better than you even know what you're going through. Because he experienced all of it too. This is the beauty of the humanity of Jesus, which you already talked about in other series. But You can't let the enemy, you can't let our culture, you can't let the world, you can't even let yourself convince you that God doesn't care about you and your pain. He walked up to a woman whom he had never met and had compassion for her because of her pain and said, do not weep. And this is why he said that. This is the next thing that he does. He says, then he came up and touched the beer. Now that's not like a drink. Calm down. What that is, is like this cart that they would put a casket on. And the bear stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man, the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Just try to picture this for a second. Try to put yourself in this reality. This dude is dead. Done. Final. Zilch. His life is over. Never see him. Talk to him again. Ever. Done. Jesus walks up, sees and has compassion for this widow. Looks at her and says, do not weep. I know your pain. I know the difficulty you're going through. I know what situation you're in that you're, you're going to die too. Do not weep. He says to this dead body, young man, rise. Old boy sets up. He he sits up and begins to speak to his mother. Jesus says, here's your son. And everyone loses their mind. As you would too. What does this mean? What's the point of this story? Here's the point of this story. The point, the whole point that this story is trying to point to, and for, for me and for you, is this reality that Jesus, God, is so powerful that he reigns over death. Here's what you need to understand. Before Jesus, death is final. This thing called sin, this evil pit that is inside of you and me that bends us towards doing the things that we know we ought not to do, it produces this thing called death. If if you're in sin, you will die. And you're done. It, final, over, never again. Clay in sin will be no more in death. But what Jesus shows us in this story is it don't have to be that way. Like it's just foreshadowing what's 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 coming, what he's going to do with himself. This young man who was done, dead, he says, arise, and he sits up. In this one show, in this one scene, in this one event, what Jesus is showing is that this thing called death, this consequence of sin, the consequence of this disobedience in the Garden of Eden that traces all the way back to Adam and Eve, it is not more powerful than God. It does not have the final say. Jesus can speak and death is no more. It's what this story is pointing us to. That's why, he, that's why Jesus said all of these Weird, radical claims. It's when he, on the cross, here's what you need to grasp about Easter. This is what you need to understand about Jesus and his death on the the cross. It's after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he's on the cross. 
said, to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died. Dead. Done. Final. No more Jesus. Dead. And here's what I need you to understand about Jesus. If this is where that story ends, there's nothing special about Jesus other than the life he lived and the miracles that he did. Cool stuff, right? He's not the Jesus that we worship if this is where the story ends. He dies. He's done. Final. Consequence of sin, boom. He took sin on himself. He gets the consequence. Done. Death is still reigning. Death is still final. It still has a grip on us. But then this happens. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared for Jesus after he died. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they, are, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why? Do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Here's what you need to understand. There's a whole bunch of people on this planet that's died. In fact, every single person that's ever lived has died. Only one person has ever resurrected himself back to life. In this one, in the resurrection, what's so cool about the resurrection is in this in this resurrection, Jesus completely kills death. Suddenly this consequence of sin that is due to all of us, he kills, puts to death, conquers death. This one act of resurrection, dies on the cross, Jesus is final, Jesus is done. Satan feels like he's won. Stone rolls away, he walks out, the disciples come, and the angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because Jesus Christ is not dead anymore. He once was, but he came back to life. There is no finality in death for Jesus. And here's what's really cool about this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he died, though he died, Yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus dies on the cross. He resurrects. He conquers death. Cool, great for him. But what the Bible is very clear about, what the gospel is very clear about, just like death was not final for Jesus, it does not have to be final for us. When we're in Christ, suddenly... Death has no sting. Suddenly, death is not final for you and me. Every one of us in this room is going to die. But that does not have to be the end of you. It ain't the end of me. Because I'm in Jesus. Because he resurrected, that means that I will too. It means that I put my faith in him, that death is not final. It is not the final say-so in my life. I am an immortal being. Which means I will live on. I will live with him because of what he did for me. This is why Paul says this. This is where everything comes. It's not what Paul says. This is what I said. This is the bottom line for tonight. Death to death means life for us. Here's what you know, it's incredible about this. Don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Death is the consequence for the sin and disobedience in the garden. It's transferred to you and me. If you commit one sin, if you do one thing wrong that you know that you're not supposed to, the consequence of that is death. Final, done, end of you. But when Jesus resurrects, when Jesus conquers death, when he puts death to death, that means we and I get to live. That in him and through him, we can live on, we can continue, that we are immortal, and we can have an eternity in heaven. That's why Paul says this. We shall not all sleep, he's talking about death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, at the end of time is what he's talking about. 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, all, must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immorality. immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are in this room right now as a Christian, as a child of God, do you understand what that means? It means that you have victory over death. Death does not get to determine the end of you because you are a victor over death through Christ. If you believe in him, if you believe in his gospel, if you believe he died on the cross for your sins and then resurrected, you get that through him. You get to be a victor. One last scripture. It says, and I saw, this is Revelation, this is the end of time, when everything's done, it says, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The death of death means life for us. You don't have to die and be done. You don't have to remain in your sin. If you've never received Christ, you are. You're just in your sin right now. Death is final. But the cool thing about Jesus and the gospel is he gives it freely. It's not like he gives all of these incredibly difficult obstacles to get through. It's not like go through this ninja course and then like maybe we'll talk. None of that. Don't get real good. Don't, don't like, you, you got to not cuss for a while and then we'll talk about it or you got to read your Bible. None of that. Jesus literally just has his arms open. He says, I've already conquered death and the life that you can have Here and in eternity is available to you if you just come to me. Just come to me. And death does not get to determine you. But you have to believe in his cross. You have to believe in his resurrection. You have to make him your Lord. You have to give him your life. God, I'm done trying to live on my own. Just please come into me. Make me new. Transform me. Do with me whatever you want to do. I believe that you died on that cross. I believe that you resurrected. And he will make you new. He will make you a new creation. He will transform you, as Paul said, in the twinkling of an eye. In one moment. And when the end comes, when the end of all this comes, the end of time, whenever that is, death, Satan, hell will all be thrown it's like a fire and you'll get to spend eternity with your heavenly father. That's why as I stood at my grandfather's bed, I think I wasn't sad. Because for my entire life, I'd watched my grandfather be bound by sin and death. I had watched him live in his own guilt, in his own shame, and I knew that if he died, he was going to hell. He was going to die and it was going to be the end of him. But two days before my grandfather actually died in this world, he gave his life to Christ. And death was no longer his master. Sin was no longer his master. And he will live on for an eternity. I'll get to be with him, and me and him will be together in heaven with Jesus because he gave his life to Christ. Death to death means life for you and for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, God. I thank you for these students. I thank you for your gospel. And Lord, I just pray that you would just like help it sink into us. 
that death has no hold on us. Whatever level of understanding we have in that, I, Lord, I just ask you to press that deeper into our hearts and minds and souls. Where these students here would understand and know that your cross was not just a horrible way to die, but instead it was an avenue towards a resurrection that would ultimately kill death itself. That they have freedom in you. They have life in you. Because you did the impossible. You killed the very consequence of the sin that we created at great cost to yourself. And so Lord, I just pray and those of us who are in this room, Lord, that are your children, that have received your gospel, Lord, that you would, you would just further fill our hearts with that reality. God, I just pray that if there's any in here in this room right now, still bound by death, Lord, if they died right now and tonight, it'd be done, it'd be final, that you would show them the beauty of your gospel and how simply it is and how easy it is for death to have no hold on them anymore. That they can live on, that they can have an eternity with you in heaven. And it's through your gospel, Lord. I just pray that you give them the courage, strength, and boldness, Lord, to mention that to their small group leader or somebody. Lord, show them literally all they have to do is just talk to you, pray to you and say, I believe, believe that you died on that cross for my sins and resurrected. Lord, I just want to give you my life. And help us live in this reality that death has no sting, has no hold on us, Lord. We'd be slaves to you, not to our guilt, to our shame, to some kind of fear. But we would live every single day of our lives in the reality of your love and what you did for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.